God is good. Um, earlier this morning, we, before the meeting started, we um, I talked about um, Kevin's dad in Toowoomba. And uh, we went up on Monday and uh, we anointed him with oil and prayed with him and had lunch with him and just shared with him and things like that. And after we did everything we'd, we'd done, and he was just sitting there and all of a sudden he uh, reached over and he, he grabbed some things. And uh, he, said, um, he said, Neil, on the 1st of March, he said, I couldn't sleep. He said, and God got me up and he said, he gave me a word for you. And uh, here's a man that's ready to, basically, to meet his, meet his maker. And I guess what amazes me is the Christ-likeness that was in him. While he, instead of being concerned about himself, he had other people on his mind, like Jesus. When he was going on the cross... He wasn't concerned about himself and what Tom was talking about today is so very real. He had us on his mind. And his main purpose, of course, is for us to triumph. And uh, that's why I love that song that we're singing today. That we're going to shout it out, amen. And he, how he, he sent, he gave me this thing and, and, I, and I just pray that I can get through this. Neil, my beloved. <laughs> Open your ear to what I'm going to say to you. Long ago, I planted my seed in you, the seed of fatherhood. This seed has my DNA. With that seed, I planted also my authority. This seed carries my own image and likeness. This seed will reproduce after its own kind, 30, 60, 90, 100 fold. I myself has watched over it and watered it. It is now ready to start reproducing. You waited till I'm nearly 80. <laughs> start casting your mantle on trustworthy sons and daughters. When God says sons, he's always talking about us. As you seek my face, I will show you who. As you take this mantle to cast, there will be another mantle waiting to start to reproduce many times over. I am ready to start drawing the father's heart to the children and the children's heart to the fathers. Nancy, your soulmate, will not miss out, for you two are one. I am well pleased with you. And I call you my friends. You will see the reproduction of this seed, says the Lord. I don't take that lightly, and I don't take it with pride, and I don't take it in the wrong manner. Last week I spoke about my life a little bit, and I said before God put his mantle on my life, I was nothing, and if he took that mantle off me, I would go back to being nothing again. It's God's presence, it's God's mantle, it's God's anointing, it's the purpose and the plan that God has for life that is the most important thing. I believe that the church really is in for the shock of its life. Yes, God's going to shake, as I've said before, and things that we never ever thought that would be shaken will be shaken. So, Father, I ask you today by your Spirit that you will help us as your people to catch the wind of your Spirit, to set our sails, to trim it, whatever has got to be done, that we will catch the wind, that it will take us, and Lord, we just give you all the praise and we give you all the glory because we want to be where you want us to be. And everybody said, Amen. 
The book of Acts is a story of an amazing transformation. As I, I'm just going to take a little bit of last week because I want to continue from there. That took place in ordinary people like you and me that we now call the disciples, the apostles, whatever you want to call them, in their lives. There's a lot of negativity. The disciples didn't understand but they didn't understand what was happening at that particular time in the realm of the spirit. They could only see the natural. And what we've got to be very careful of is that we don't become victims of what we see in the natural, but that we will allow God's word to get it into our hearts and take us beyond and take us into whatever God wants us to go into. See, right now, we may not be able to see it, but God is doing something in the realm of the Spirit worldwide that perhaps man's understanding hasn't caught up with yet. I've said this many times. I was in a meeting one time, and it was just at the end of the meeting, like I normally do come out and, and uh, take the worship and, and lead the church and... And in my own heart and in my own mind, there was a, a frustration. There was what you read in the Word and what you see happening didn't seem to connect. And, and I was sort of, though I was leading worship and though I was doing whatever I was doing, my heart was going out to another realm. And I, I heard God say, Neil, you would be surprised if you really knew what I was doing right now. Even in the hearts of people, even in what you might be looking at, I'm doing, even, I'm doing something even more than that. And, uh, and I believe that that's the hour that we're living in right now. And I've got a question for you today. Do you want... God's to revolutionize your life by His Spirit. You want God to... Rev see, I, I see a bunch of guys in the book of Acts that had their whole lives revolutionized. Fishermen became different people altogether. Revolutionize means to change something radically. That's what God's doing in your life right now. Whether you know it or realize it, that's what God's doing. Amen? How many people want to be that sort of person? Or do we just want to be like other people? Do we just want to be like other Christians? Or do we just want to be like other churches? Or do we want to be unique? The disciples were most probably good Jewish boys before they were transformed. Before God touched them, they were most probably just good Jewish boys doing, just going with the flow. You know what one of the greatest tragedies is that we can just go with the flow or else we can make a few things happen. They were doing what they thought was right. Saul, who became Paul, really thought what he was doing was right. Until God did something in his life that revolutionized his life. How many people want to be revolutionized? I'm going to ask this question many times today. Because you see, if you don't want it, you just become like other Christians. You just become like other people or else we can become revolutionized. And that's the group of people that are going to change the world. Is that okay to talk like this? God's seeking people, not just ordinary people. He's seeking people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. In other words, He's not just looking for a bunch of people that are going to sing songs. He's looking for people that will be revolutionized, doing what they thought was right, 
But when God touched that young man, changed his life forever. Mary was most probably just a good Jewish girl. But God came and spoke to her and revolutionized her life. God revolutionizes your life by revelation. There's a lot of things that are being spoken right now in the realm of the Spirit, in the prophetic realm, that when we listen to it and when you read things and you look at it, and even as I was reading that, the natural man has to rise up and say, did you wait till I was 80? No, God has used our lie. I'm not 80 yet, by the way. <laughs> God, we've seen a move of God, and I had another thing from, from Kinder. You are a man who cries for visitation, and your eyes, like the servant of old, has said, mine eyes have seen the glory and you know you've seen the glory, you've basked in the glory, and you'll never be satisfied until you see it again. I've seen the glory, I've seen the power of God, I've seen God manifest Himself in amazing ways. And that's where we're at right now. But God speaks by revelation. Martin Luther revolutionized the whole kingdom, the whole Christian world by, by a statement, the just shall live by faith. Revelation. Moses, a burning bush that spoke to him. From a backslidden state on the backside of a desert, all hope gone, all of a sudden, a revelation. A manifestation of God, whatever you want to call it changed his whole life and revolutionized his life. Who wants to have your life revolutionized? Peter, a fisherman, I will make you a fisher of men. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Simon, but Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, a revelation will revolutionize your life. Peter became an amazing man of God. In Ephesians 1.17, the Word of God says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. If you read the whole chapter, it'll do you good to read that whole chapter. Though it was written by Paul, it is expressing God's desire for you and I, the church. It wants to give us wisdom, wants, wants us to be enlightened, knowing what is God's great power? Friend, the church has got to have a fresh understanding of God's power and God's authority. Enlightened means knowing that His great power is working in us. Anybody want to be enlightened? <laughs> Understand what God is doing in us. You see, the church has become more social than spiritual. It's more about the cappuccino, the comfort, the, this, the thises and the thats. The church has become more social than spiritual. I believe both are important. I, I want you to be my friends. I want to have fellowship, amen. That's part of me. That's part of you. I want to enjoy a good feed. I want to enjoy a steak or whatever it might be. I want to be able to enjoy. It's great. But it's not at the cost 
of the most important part of my life. And that's my relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Man is fearful of becoming religious. Even unsaved people don't want to become religious. When I got saved, I want to tell you, I needed to get saved. <laughs> right? I didn't get saved out of the choir, boys. I got sa saved out of the miry clay, out of the stench of sin. I needed to be saved. But it was interesting, my friends, my mates, when they heard that I gave my life to, well, well, I didn't know that. When they heard that I was going to church, they started to pray for me. <laughs> Poor Neil's got religion. They didn't know they were praying. And they got, felt sorry for me. Because, you see, man's greatest fear is that we become religious. You know why? Because in man's mind, when you become religious, you have to stop doing all the things you want to do. All the things you enjoy doing. All the things that are fun and God takes, that God is a killjoy. I don't know about you, but I believe that God is joy unspeakable. Amen. I believe the joy of the Lord is my strength. I, I've had more joy than I've ever had in my life. Amen. I've wept I, I've, I, as I've watched Bob's funeral on, on last week or this week. I was watching the children, and, and I'm, there's a ceremony going on, but I'm just watching these kids as, as tears rolling down their cheeks and, and, and obviously the relationship that they had with their granddad, and I'm just having, a, having my own little ceremony here, just watching kids. My heart was overflowing as I saw their love for their granddad. We can't become more social than spiritual. We've got to become both. Don't get religious. Receive revelation and be revolutionized. <laughs> be changed forever. Amen. I'm talking pretty steady here. I just don't want to get off what I've got to say today because I believe what I've got to say will revolutionize your life. Anybody want to be revolutionized? <laughs> True. Come on. Does anybody want to be revolutionized? Or do we just want to stay the same? Just want to stay like we are? In the book of Acts, the disciples were empowered by a pure flow of the Holy Spirit, supernatural power. You see, they had an advantage because they lived in the era when it was poured out in its purity. You know what I'm talking about? It's still being poured out in its purity, but it's got to come through the filters of all the negativity and all the wrong teaching and all the wrong thinking and all the wrong stuff that gets into our mind. And when it comes out the end, it's virtually void of power. Because we all hear the stories and we all hear the sayings, we all hear the words, we all hear it. But they were empowered by a pure flow of the Holy Spirit, supernatural power. I believe today the Holy Spirit has been humanized. Is that a word? Is that a right way to say it? We've, we've sort of made the Holy Spirit like us instead of us like Him. We've made Jesus instead of the Son of God and, and we look at his life on this earth and we, and we try to make him like us instead of us like him. See, Jesus isn't the man that walked on this planet some 2,000 years ago. Yes, he, wa he was for, th for uh, 30 odd years, whatever, 33 and a half years, but then when, when he paid the price and everything was done, he went back and sat on the right hand. He sat in his place of authority. He sat there as the Son of God. And that's who he is today. We try to humanize. For some, 
the Holy Spirit is un, in the cupboard under the platform. For some of you that might not have heard that story, I came into the in here one morning when the Catholics were still here. And we've got very good friends with these people. They're lovely people. And, and I was just saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And one of the guys said, what are you saying? I said, I'm just saying Holy Spirit. He said, oh, he said, we've got to put him in the cupboard. And I looked at him. I said, would you please let him out? We need him. <laughs> So for some, he's in the cupboard under the platform, just a symbol, just a symbol. For some, he was the power the early church worked with, but it's long gone. He died with, when the disciples died. For some... He's tied up in some doctrinal arguments. But for some, he's the power of God. For some, he is the power of God. That's being poured out all over the world. Do you want to be revolutionized? Do you want to be transformed? Do you want to be changed? You see, the disciples wanted much more than to build a church. The disciples just didn't want to build a church. They were asking God to empower them to move out and impact an entire culture. The Lord's been challenging me lately about prayer. I believe that we've got to start to ask God to empower us that we will be able to impact the culture that's over the Sunshine Coast. How can that happen? How can that happen if all the churches become as a social event? It's got to come by a demonstration of power. It's got to come by something that's more significant than what we're seeing right now. Ask God, choose this Tuesday night, I guarantee you, we're going to ask God to empower us, to impact the whole culture of the Sunshine Coast. Amen? And believe for a move of the Spirit. In the, 19, in, in, in the 1700s, there was a guy by the name of William Law. He was an, an English writer and he wrote these words. Read whatever chapter of Scripture you will and be ever so delighted with it, yet it will leave you as poor, as empty, and as unchanged as it found you, unless it has turned you wholly and solely to the Spirit of God and brought you into full union with a dependence upon him. Hmm. Paul wrote these words. He said, when I come to you, I did not come to you with excellence of speech or with, you, with human wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing. Everybody say nothing. I determined to know nothing except the power of God. That your faith wouldn't be in the wisdom of man, but it would be in the demonstration of power. And friend, when we're going to, on Tuesday nights, we're going to start believing God for a demonstration of His power. Amen? A demonstration. God, empower us. Help us to demonstrate the power. What is missing in the church? in my life, in the world. I believe that we've been disconnected from the original vision. We've been disconnected and church has gone its own way and God's over here going this way. But church now, we've got all these different philosophies and different thinkings and cultures. 
You know, the church has got a culture. It's been disconnected from the original vision, God's vision. And God's original vision is this. Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness, and we will give them dominion. The church has lost its position. Amen? We've lost our, our purpose. We've lost our, we're, we're trying to get people into the kingdom through I don't know what. But you see, God wants to give us dominion. He wants to give us authority. He wants to change our lives. We've been dis disconnected from the original vision. We've got to get back to the original vision. God, I am created in your image. I am created in your likeness. God, I am not boasting in myself, but my God, this is your purpose and this is your plan for me, that God, I will have dominion over all the works of the enemy. I'll have dominion over all the fish and the whatever else is going on. Amen. He wants us to have authority. And what I see in these disciples and what you've got to understand was when the Holy Spirit was originally poured out, it was in its unadulterated state. And they heard, they heard from God and, and the revelations and the prophetic and goodness knows what. But today the church and around the world is full of false prophets, it's full of wrong teaching, it's full of wrong stuff. People say God said and God had nothing to do with it. It's easy to say God did this or God said this or God said all that or I heard from God. There's so much confusion, so much going on around here. We've got to come back to the original vision. We've got to somehow or other understand that God, that same Holy Ghost, and I want to tell you, friends, the only way you're going to find it is if you seek Him with all your heart and you lean not to your own understanding, but in every way acknowledge Him and He will direct your path and He will fill you afresh and He will anoint you again. It's no good just sort of being like a lump of seaweed coming in and out and expecting the power of God to be manifested in your life. It's a cost. The cost. The cost. The church, I believe, is under attack. I believe the church is being, yeah. Let us make man in our own image. Give him dominion. But instead of us being and having dominion and authority and power and goodness knows what, man has become a slave. Mankind has become slaves. We're a slave to debt. We're a slave to so many things. A plastic card called a credit card has brought people to their knees. We've, be, we've become a slave to, to, to sort of want to be important. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that He might destroy the works of Satan. Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The devil wants to change the culture of the church. He wants to change your perspective of God. One way to recognize where you're going is, or where you're at, is who or what we're concerned for. I know Dave won't mind. Dave was having a little bit of a bad day. How many people have ever had a bad day? I said, Dave, think of the people of the fires that just lost everything and then have a look at your problem. <laughs> See, the enemy just wants us to keep us looking in. Looking in, got to look beyond that. Amen. Here, Roma, talk about the attacks and that, but you're going to kick devil butt, I can tell you that, girl. The little band of warriors that we've got going, I tell you what, that's going to be something else. 
It's how you recognise it. I've got, a, I've got a, a bit of news here. Church is not just for yuppies. Or professionals. It's for everybody. Jesus came to save the lost. That's in Luke 19.10. Sin has a very negative effect on people. We don't understand so many things because we look at people at the outward. Ivan Nosworthy, a good mate of mine, used to do the, he was a policeman, he used to do the watch houses, whatever that was. And he said of a morning he'd go in there because the guys had been drunk and got messed up and everything like that and been locked up for the night to sober up. He said he went into this guy and he'd seen him many times. And he looked at him and he said, oh, mate, he said, what's going on? Why? Blah, blah, blah. He had mess, dirt, filth. And this guy, as, as somebody for a, somebody started to take a little bit of interest in him because Ivan used to actually get some water and a cloth and, and wash them and clean them and, and, and care for them. And, you know, this guy might, might never have had anybody care for him much. They just look at you and treat you like a dog. He said as he was cleaning him up and looking at him, he was saying, oh, mate, what's going on, you know? And this guy said tears, you know, started rolling down his cheek. And he looked and he said, really, he said, I wasn't always like this. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, I had a business not far from here in the main street of town. He said, I was a solicitor. Set a beautiful home out at Fig Tree Pocket. Five acres of land, swimming pool, horses, cattle, stuff. Had a wife and three children. Beautiful. He said, one day, he said, I got a phone call from my wife and she said, honey, she said, it's raining and it's pouring and she said, the dam's overflowing and the water's starting to come and everything like that. She said, I'm scared. Would you come home? I've got the two girls with me. He said he jumped in his car and drove home as fast as he could. And as he went over the ridge that leads to his house, as he looked over the ridge, he said all he could find, he said the house was gone. The great mudslide had come through and just taken the house, his wife, the two kids, everything that he had. And he said, I had a good friend. He said, I had a good friend. And he came around to comfort me and he said, friend, he said to me, he said, he had a brown paper bag that contained a bottle of whiskey. And he said, this will help you. This will help you. This will help you. And he said, he poured me one. He poured me one. He said, I haven't stopped pouring him since. See, People need the Lord. We, not a brown paper bag, but we're the carriers. The world wants to give it a whiskey. We want to give them life. But unless God revolutionizes our life, we're just going to be like everybody else. And what did you say today, Tom? Me, my, me, myself, and I. Who wants to get revolutionized? <laughs> I've got a lot more I want to say, but I think I've said enough. Father, will you stand with me, folks? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. See, lest the Lord build the house, they that build it labor in vain. I wonder today if we can just look at ourselves and I make no excuse for preaching the way I've preached this morning. 
and make no excuse for it whatsoever. Because every word I'm saying to you is coming back to me ten times more. But Father, revolutionise our life. Change us, Father. Change us and help us. Transform our lives. Change our lives. Help us, Father. Holy Ghost. Only the anointing, only the power of God can change us. And that's the decision that you need to make. That's something that you need to be able to, yeah, whatever. Thank you, Father. We're just going to do some ministry right now. I'm going to pray for a few people. And I minister to some people. But before I do that, I just want, to, want you to shut your eyes for a moment. How many people, are honestly, deep down on the inside of you, there's a stirring right now? Would you just give me a wave? Come on, let me see. It. Let me, come on. You know God's asking you to it's just draw. And, there's something going on on the inside of you. Quickly, just slip it up. Tell the truth. We're going to pray at the end of the meeting. I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going to believe for God. I'm going to believe for that mantle. I'm going to believe. I'm going to cast that mantle over you today. Amen.